With every breath a new song With every day a new praise Cause you're a good God You're a good God I will taste of your goodness I will dance in your mercy Cause you're a good God Your praise is always on my lips Your praise is always on my lips Your praise is always on my lips How can I keep it in? Wherever I go, you're with me Every step filled with blessings Cause you're a good guy You're a good guy Every hour in your love Still I can't get enough of you Cause you're a good guy Your place is always on my lips Oh, your praise is always on my lips Your praise is always on my lips How can I keep it in? How can I keep it in? Whoa. Fam, welcome home. Wherever you're tuning in from, I want you to know that we are so glad that you're joining us. I'm Regina, one of the senior leaders, and I lead the young adult and tertiary connect groups. We are living in extraordinary times, so I get that it can be tough navigating life. But I want you to know that you are not alone in your journey. There's so much goodness in you that the world needs, so keep on pressing on. That's it. Nothing beats hanging out with friends. So be sure to join us to gatherings in real life. We meet on Sundays, 2 to 4 p.m. at church. Also, follow us on Instagram at The Evolution Fam and The Evolution Youth to stay connected with us. DM us if you need some help getting to church or you have something you'd like us to pray for. 
We can't wait to connect with you too. And now, before we get into another great message, a moment to give our tithes and offerings. This is our act of worship, also our act of love towards our community. As you give, know that you're sowing into the future of TiVo, the dreams of our youth and our hope of creating better humanity. So if you've been blessed by our messages, I want to encourage you to give out of a heart of gratitude. Scan a QR code to give through PayNow or head over to theevolution.org give for other giving options. Your giving propels us to continue doing the good we've been doing. We are going to impact more lives together. Now ready your heart because we have an awesome message. Jesus in the Bible always comes alive in our church. Sit tight and enjoy this message. Okay, hey, so uh, the, my message today uh, is titled Live Full. Live Full. And I think we do live pretty fully, right? Are we? <laughs> well, maybe we think that way because life seems to be very busy, right? Very hectic nowadays. And I don't think it's just because I'm getting older. Not when the youth I met tells me, I meet tells me that their number one pet peeve in life is when people walk slowly. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> What's with all the hurrying, right? You know, we open our eyes and um, it's another brand new day. Five to six out of that brand new day, it, it's rushing to school. Or it's, if it's not rushing to school, it's rushing to work. The homework and exams never fails to show up at your doorsteps on time. And if there's anything you know about work, it's that they seem to always multiply. Always. And so often we get so bogged down by you know, all the busyness of life and the rhythm of life. We just get by. We just do what's in front of us. We just try to survive. Other times, we get so consumed with regrets and worries. It's either regrets, if not it's worries, if not it's both. We get so hung up with the past when we are free, <laughs> when we are too free. We get so hung up with the past to be in the moment and to appreciate and enjoy the moment. Or we get so anxious about tomorrow that we cannot engage with today. And it's no wonder Oscar Wilde, a poet, right? He says this, that to live is the rarest thing in the world. Most people just exist. And that is also maybe the reason why we chase after experiences that helps us feel alive, right? Jumping from one bandwagon of trends and fads to another. From one Netflix series to another one. You name it, from chasing vacations, right, to concerts, to <laughs> move, <laughs> yeah, some of you, <laughs> to uh, accomplishments, to the next hype thing, to chasing, you know, chasing daylight, chasing wind. We give our hearts and our wallets to what gives us the high. Very often, the high is in the chase itself. So what's with all the chasing, right? And the thing about high is that the high never leaves us in a better space. We have a hangover almost immediately after that, which kind of saps all the life inside of us and leaves us wanting more. It's a terrible feeling, right? You're tired, but you want more of it. And the way I see is that you see all underneath of all of this is a longing to feel more alive to be more alive, right? And yes, should we be alive? Yes, we should be alive. You know, when you look into the Bible, that's God's intent for you. In John 10.10, 10, it says that Jesus said, Jesus came to so that we could have life, so that they could have life indeed, so that they could live life to the fullest. God came to give us life in its richness, in its abundance, in its fullness so that we may have life and enjoy life, right? And that sounds pretty good, right? 
sounds pretty good to me, to love life, enjoy life in its richness and its fullness. So what is this life that we're talking about? How do we live into a fuller life instead of a busier life? There are so, so many lessons and wisdom in the Bible that teaches us about a full life, a significant life. And I encourage you to go and read your Bible, to uncover them one by one. So what we're going to talk about today is not comprehensive. It is not a four things checklist that you can check it off and yay, at the end of it, yes, I'm living a full life. I don't have the answers either, but just two thoughts to encourage all of us in our journey of life and faith and growth as a person. To encourage us to live more intentionally, hopefully closer to the life, the full life that Jesus talks about, to live fully. So the first thought, two thoughts. First thought is this, that we live to die and we die to live. So we can't talk about life without talking about death. Life and death are deeply interconnected in the human experience. Death in any form, whether it's a physical form, a tangible form, an intangible form, is often seen as the you know, great human enemy. <laughs> we all fear death, all dislike death. Well, maybe not all of you, some of you are like, I'm not afraid of death, okay? But most, a lot of people fear death. We don't want to die. We don't want especially good things to die. And people do all sorts of things to avoid it, to deny it, to delay death. Okay. It's interesting to find that when we are not ready to die, it's usually because we have never truly lived. It's interesting to find that people who have touched real life are often the ones who find it easier to let it go. But it's people who have yet to begin truly living their life who fear death the most. But death is not to be feared. In fact, Steve Jobs once um, said this, that mortality, mortality was the greatest tool that he used to make big decisions in life. He said that almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, fear of failure, embarrassment, just falls away in the face of death, leaving only what's important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way to avoid the trap of thinking that you have something to lose. That you are already naked, so there is no reason not to be bold, to be courageous, to go ahead. You know, with that, I want to encourage us to be courageous in the way that we live our life. You know, the question we should ask ourselves is when we are so anxious, when I am so anxious all the time to ask myself, Will this matter in 10 years' time? Right? Will this matter in 20 years' time? Chances are the things that we fritz about, are anxious about, worry about, may not matter much in 10 years' time. In 20 years' time, for the matter. In the moment, it feels very overwhelming. It feels like your whole world, right? But it will pass and it will not matter that much. You know, when you are making a decision to ask yourself, will this matter in 10, 20, 30 years time? Uh, Regina, my wise friend, ever tells me that <laughs> sometimes, yeah, in a moment when things are difficult, you feel like giving everything up, you feel like throwing the towel in and walk away and, you know, and be cool. But will you really be happy 10 years down the road? It's a conversation we often have when we are struggling, when we have a difficult time. Do we do this or do we not do this? Will you really be happy? Is this what's best for you 10 years down the road? Sometimes, yeah, in a moment, you want to compromise on some things. You, know, you want to give in on some things. But is this good for your soul, for your character development, for who you really want to be? Because those things matter in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time. So for all our adults, for all our young adults, um, I want to encourage us to be courageous. Don't live in the shadow of fear. It's the same thing I tell myself too. You know, quit the job that you know you should. <laughs> be the 
are confident you that you have always envisioned yourself to be. Believe in the dream that God has put in your heart. Be the passionate, hopeful, faithful you that's always inside of you. We will never truly live if there is nothing we will die for. There's nothing you'll be passionate and live out fully for. So there's got to be a purpose, a dream, a, you know, a passion that comes alive in you. you. We can't just do our job. We can't just survive day to day. We just can't circle around in our tiny little orbit with our tiny little friends. We just can't. There's got to be more than that to truly live. So be courageous and to live bigger. Okay, for all our youth, and I was reading a Bible reading plan this week. With our, uh, was it last week with our CG on uh, in in July for the book of for the book of Luke, right? So in Luke four four it says Jesus answered by quoting Deuteronomy. It takes more than bread to really live. So the question to ask ourselves is, what is your brand? Bread was a staple food in those days, and it's held with great importance day to day. I mean, it's still uh, held with importance today, okay? It keeps them alive. It's what fills their tummy. For a foodie, probably what keeps them happy. Everybody has a different bread. What's your bread? What keeps you alive? What fills you up? What makes you happy? You got something in your mind? And what this verse is saying is that it's going to take more than your bread. It's going to take more than what keeps you alive. Your bread. For example, your money, your marriage, your partner, your friends, your achievements, your fame, fun, hype, popularity. It's going to take more than your Netflix, your vacations, your games. I'm just naming every bread I know. <laughs> Activities, your concerts. Anything tangible to really live fully. Luke 6, 24 right, to 26, it goes on and says, but it's trouble ahead if you think you have made it. You have all your achievements, all your success, all your money. Because what you have is all you ever get. And we all know that it's never going to be enough. It's trouble ahead if you are satisfied with yourself. Yourself will not satisfy you for too long. It's trouble ahead if you think life's all fun and games. Because there's suffering to be met and you're going to meet it. And what do you do? There's trouble ahead when you live only for the approval of others saying what flatters them, doing what indulges them. So there's a lot of trouble for us. There's four troubles there. For all of you, for all of us, in fact, for all of us, it takes more than your bread to really live. So the question is, what's more than my bread? Hmm, pretty good question, right? One of which is your character, your values, who you are as a person, your beliefs, your faith is important. Who you are becoming is important. This will matter in 10, 20 years to come. You know, things like fun and activities, hype and success, even friendships and relationships, they will look different in five years' time. In 10 years' time, in 15 years' time. Some of it may not even matter. Some level of fun may not matter that much in 20 years' time when you are 40 years old and 50 years old and 60 years old, right? But your character, your faith, your belief, your essence, your person, they stay with you for life. The thing about getting older is that you're going to spend more and more time with yourself. Are you going to be happy with who you are? So I want to encourage you, keep your character, your faith, your person, commit to character developing. Commit to love in difficult times. Commit to faith in difficult times. 
Commit to kindness. Commit to faithfulness in challenging times. Commit to keep doing what is good for your soul and character, not what is easy. Okay? So disappointments and heartbreaks are really difficult, which is why we always you know, want to find an easy way out. Because it's difficult. It's difficult. Which is another reason why we fear death and we avoid death at all costs. Because what do we do when our dreams die? What do we do when someone breaks our heart? What do we do when our ideals of what we think the world is and uh, what we want gets shattered into pieces, right? I came across an adaptation of um, Jesus' conversation with his disciples. It goes, When it became clear that the master was going to die, the disciples were depressed. The master smilingly said, Don't you see that death gives loveliness to life? And the disciples say, no, we'll, rather, we'll much rather you never die. And then the master replies, whatever is truly alive must die. Look at the flowers. Only plastic flowers never die. I like how it's put across that whatever is truly alive must die. Whatever is truly alive will die. Will die. What we pour life into do die at some point. Dreams, they die. And the same goes for some relationships, some desires, some hopes, um, some ideals. We die to older versions of ourselves. But the good news is that death makes way for life. We die to live is the ironic thing. We die so that we live. John 12, 24 says, Listen carefully, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. So when a seed dies, it creates new life for a new plant. Bearing many more seeds. We know this. Death makes way for new life. So in the ecosystem and life cycle of plants, after a plant age and dies, right? The process, we know this, the process of decomposition happens when the plant will be broken down into simpler organic substances and then the nutrients are released back into the ground, into the soil. These nutrients are what make the soil good ground. These nutrients are what make the soil a good ground for the growth of new plants. And in good soil, we will always find resurrection power. Dreams die to make way for new beginnings. Our desires and hopes die to make way for new ones. Our old behaviors, our habits, our cells, our old cells die to make way for new change and for new versions. And part of maturing and growing up, even though it's difficult, is to embrace death, disappointments, and heartbreaks. It is to understand and appreciate the cycle of life. And that for sure is a journey. We don't get there on day one. But I believe we will get there. Okay, so embrace that the soil of our hearts be of good grounds even more so with deaths, with disappointments, with discouragement, so that we birth new beginnings, new hopes, and new dreams. So, you know, I want to encourage us to live fully in that way. And also to understand that life is a gift. It's a beautiful one. Even though at times um, I struggle navigating through life and understanding, you know, the totality of, of things which I believe that you are and we are from time to time as well, right? But it is a gift. Life is a gift. It's an opportunity to connect and to create. The thing is, you know, life is so short in the grand scheme of things. So much so that it is so insignificant. I mean, if you look at history and the history of the planet and the universe and all that and so on and so forth, right? <laughs> and then you see the numbers are like by the millions and the billions and so on. 
And, and human life is, you can't compare. It's, it's too small, too insignificant. But that's also exactly the reason why it's precious. And it, to use it, to live it for something more significant. Because it's so short to waste it away. What do we give our lives to? Right, is the question. Is it just ourselves? Is it just our plans, our careers, our comfort, our partners, our family? Do we just give our lives to chasing daylight, chasing wind? Is the question. Taking an excerpt from Owen McManus' book, right, The Last Arrow, he talks about there was a time where he and his wife, Kim McManus, um, were in Beirut preparing to go into Becca Valley. They were minutes from the borders where ISIS war was at war with the people of Lebanon. But before they were allowed to jump into their cars and cross over, they were asked to take a moment to fill out a series of forms. And he, when he was looking over the forms, there was this one thing that, one question that jumped right back at him. And it, the heading was simply proof of life. Proof of life. He had been to a lot of crazy places in the world, but he had never had to fill in a form demanding proof of life. <laughs> Basically, there were a series of blank spaces where he could write down questions that could be asked if he was taken hostage. Questions that only him and the people closest to him would know the answers to. Basically, to prove that he is indeed alive. Hmm. So he knew he had to take this seriously, right? But he kept thinking to himself, what are the proofs of my life? He wanted to write down things like, he loves dancing in the rain. <laughs> and uh, he stops on the side of the road to smell wildflowers <laughs> and run through the fields. But really, what are the proofs of your life? What are the proofs of your existence? In that moment for him, he said, that the real proof of life was that he and his wife, along with an amazing young cinematographer named Jake Vero Montes, were willing to enter a part of the world where their lives would be at risk so as to give others a chance to live. So as they were also filling out the forms, they were given one caution to make sure to put answers to questions that they will remember. Because the officer said that they have people who filled these who couldn't even remember what their own answers were. <laughs> and or they fill in something their loved ones don't even know the answers to. And I want to end off with this, that if we were to ask the people closest to us this question, the question is, what would you say are the three most powerful proofs of my life? What would you say are the three most powerful proofs of my life. What would their answers be? What would your answer be? What is your proof of life? What are you doing right now, or what are we doing right now, that proves to the world, or at least to those in our world, that we are fully alive? Right? That's the first thought. The second and the last thought is this, that God is the one who gives life. It's this thought that God is the one who gives us life. In John 6, 68, it says, Simon Peter replied, Master, to whom would we go? You have the words of real life, eternal life. And the word life here is the Greek word zoe. And the definition from the Greek lexicon is that it is physical life, the state of a person who is possessed of vitality, basically a life, you know, moving, animated. The absolute secondary uh, explanation, the absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God. Third one, life real and genuine, a life active and vigorous, 
a life devoted to God. That is life. When Simon Peter was saying that, Jesus, you have the words of life. That God has the words for our day-to-day life. He has the words for fullness of life, for us to live genuinely, for us to live actively. Now really, where else can we turn to? Who else can we run to for life? Now I want us to recall a time when God first spoke to you. It could be a verse, a story in the Bible, an encouragement, a promise, a feeling, a painted vision, a word to your conscience, a whisper that almost feels audible in a quiet room. Recall a time when God first spoke to you. So many times when He speaks, our heart softens in a way that we never thought possible. I'm always very fascinated how our mindsets, the way we think, can shift when God speaks. Really. Because how can we see something differently? Think about it. I mean, people can go through life, you know, and experiences, and they say that experiences will teach you some things about life. Yeah, that is true. But I mean, people can go through all of that and still relatively be stuck in the same mode of thinking. Or people just experience confirmation bias, right? Where everything around them just keeps validating a certain mindset, a certain uh, belief that they, they, they feel. They say, there it is, there you go. This is the proof to what I'm thinking all the time. Do people really break into new levels of thinking? It's very difficult and it's challenging. But I find that God is able to shift our thinking. He's able to move like just that little notch and you see the world a little bit differently. Like really, like you just feel your whole horizon just opens up the moment you open your heart to Him and He shifts that little bit. It's not completely, but just a little bit. He is the God who has the words for dry bones to come alive in Isaiah. He can do quite the impossible. The one interesting thing about this breath of life is the first mention is in Genesis 2-7. And I read to you the Jewish um, translations. Then, then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the Hebrew word for the life here is nishma sheim. And then man became a living soul. So nishma, nishma sheim refers to the gasp of air. Like, you know, when you gasp for air. And a beginning of life. Humans' first breath of life started with like a gasp. Or like when a baby, you know, comes into the new world and they take their first gasp. But the interesting bit I find from this verse, Genesis 2-7, henceforth, from this point onwards, all further users of this phrase, breath of life, now used the term ruach. That means 2-7 is the one without the word ruach, right? And then from there onwards, all mentions of breath of life has this word ruach. So it changes from nishma cheim to sometimes nishma ruach cheim or ruach cheim. And the word ruach basically means the breath, the spirit of God. And what am I saying here is that Life, from the moment God encounters mankind, the moment God encounters you, the moment God meets you, life from this point onwards will be embedded in His Spirit. In the Ruach of God, in God's Spirit. That God is in you is what I'm saying. That we can't deny how embedded His Spirit is with us and with His creation and with this universe. That He is here, He is closer to us like our breath is to us. His Spirit is embedded in His creation. The moment He has come into contact with you, with the world, His Spirit is 
here in this universe. And when we work these words of life, right, into our own life, is what Luke 6 says that if you work the words of, into your life, Jesus says, you're like a smart carpenter who dug deep and laid the foundation of his house on bedrock. When the river burst its banks and crashed against the house, nothing could shake it. It was built to last. But if you just use my words in Bible studies and don't work them into your life, you are like a dumb carpenter who built a house but skipped the foundation. And when the swollen river came crashing and it collapsed like a house of cards, it was a total loss. And what I want to encourage is to love God's Word and to listen out to Him. That because our lives, our full lives depends on Him. And the way we are built is we are embedded in God as much as God is embedded in us. We need His words for our life. You know, a verse I want to leave us with is in Luke chapter 24, verse 5. And this verse is also speaking to me where it says, Why do you look for the living among the dead? For context, this was when the angel tells Mary Magdalene, right? Why is she looking for Jesus in the tomb on the third day when Jesus has already risen? But I thought it's so apt for our lives. Why do we go looking for the living among the dead? Why are we looking at the wrong places for answers to our heart and to our soul? Why are we desperately finding life among dead things? Right? Why do we do that? And adapting from the second half of the angel's reply, so that was the first half. Second half of his, I, I adapted it, of, his angels, of the angel's reply is that he, which is God, isn't here. Remember what he told you while he was still with you. And with that, you know, I want to encourage us to, to find God. And I know sometimes if you have, you know, gone too lost in the journey, that it's hard to start somewhere <laughs> to find. But to like what the angel says, to remember what he told you while he was still with you. What did God tell you when he was still with you? And that will be that point where you start to find. And I want to encourage us to live fully. And of course, like what I said, you know, in the Bible, there's so many other things to teach you, to tell you, to tell us how do we live significantly. But today, for today, two, two things. One is to be courageous, to embrace uh, difficult times, um, moments. And secondly, to have God's breath of life, to have God's Word, to have His um, life in us. Okay? And that's all I have.